I'm Dan Lewis. I'm Nate's dad. I grew up in the Orange County area, La Habra to be specific. My mom, my dad, and my sister, so we just had a small family. When I was around nine or 10, my parents started investigating faith and going to church. And so they decided to attend a small church in La Habra. We went for a couple years. My junior year of high school, I decided that I wanted to learn a little bit more about this Christian faith that I had been introduced to as a kid, but had stepped away from. And so I started to attend that small church in La Habra again. January 3rd, 1993, I decided to give my heart to the Lord. Hi, and I'm Michelle. Um, I also grew up in Orange County in Southern California, and I am the oldest of four kids, and I grew up in a home where, from as young as I can remember, um, I knew who God was. My mom was very faithful, and um, we went to Mass every Sunday, but I didn't have that relationship with Him. I didn't really at all, I think, really have a relationship with Christ at all. That I didn't really discover until Dan and I started dating. And I also started learning more about the Bible. I started reading more about the Bible, learning more about God's character and who Jesus was and the Holy Spirit and all these things that I don't think I really quite understood up until that point. <laughs> and so as we were on this journey together, we were also quite serious in our relationship, but I wanted to make that own decision for myself. And I wanted to accept Jesus as my savior. And so I did. By the giving and receiving of rings, therefore I proclaim that they are now husband and wife, those whom God has joined together. Let no one separate. You're looking good, baby. You're looking good. So Nathan is our rule follower. He did not like to take risks. He would overthink everything. He wanted to make sure that, he wanted to make sure it would be safe um, or right. And so for instance, like in preschool, they would there would be silly preschool days, pajama day or backwards day, or even they would change things up in the, in the preschool day. But um, Nathan, would need to make sure that it was actually pajama day before he would leave this house in his pajamas <laughs> to go to preschool. Because to him, what is wrong, mom? I am not supposed to go to preschool in my pajamas. But so I had to bring his pajamas in the car. We would go to school, let him see. See, buddy, it is pajama day at preschool. And then he would get into his pajamas and then he would feel comfortable and safe knowing he was doing the right thing. Nate was always the safe one. He couldn't do rock climbing because he couldn't get himself more than two feet off the ground. He never climbed up on walls or climbed up trees. He hated being in places that wasn't safe. Nate and I were in the same homeschool program and uh, I joined in seventh grade and we kind of knew each other, um, but we didn't really become friends until one summer after working a vacation Bible study. We all went over to his house, um, me and a couple of the other guys, and we were just staying up super, super late. I believe it was Nate, he asked, okay, let's be serious guys. What girl are you interested in? And he made us all go around and talk about whatever girl we were currently interested in at the time. Ended up being a really fun, really bonding time and kind of made me realize, hey, like I, I really like this guy. Of course it'd be, it was because of girls, but it was because of girls. Biola University is a Christian college in La Mirada, California. They have a bunch of different majors that you can major in. I am a business major. I concentrate in entrepreneurship. Nate and I both chose to go to Biola independently, actually. He, of our friend group, was the first one to choose Biola. 
um, and I originally wasn't going to go to college. But after both visiting Biola and spending time up here, he decided, yeah, I'm going to go to Biola and you can come with me or not. And then I, maybe a month or so later, also committed to go to Biola and was kind of like, well, I guess we're both going to Biola. We should probably be roommates, right? And uh, just kind of ended up working out. How's that? I know Nate because I lived on the room to the right of him. So I met him and his roommate DJ during welcome week. The day of Nate's accident was kind of just a regular day. At the time, I would get up early, go to the gym. I was working on my master's degree, so then I would do some school in the morning. Michelle was tutoring uh, the kids of a friend of ours. And so it was just a regular day. That night, um, Michelle and Matt and I went out and had Greek food at a local restaurant. And we were, as a family, we were watching America's Got Talent and the finale was on. Right as we had finished watching it, uh, DJ, Nate's friend and his doormate called me and he says, and I, rem I remember very clearly, he says to me, hey Dan, I have some not so awesome news. Nate's been in an accident. <laughs> and I, I bolted up to the edge of the couch and I sat up and I'm like, wait, what? Uh, he said, you know, Nate was skateboarding and he got hit by a pickup truck. Uh, it happened up near Biola in La Mirada and they were gonna take him to UCI Medical Center and we grabbed hardly anything because we didn't understand what was about to happen. We just knew we needed to get to the hospital. Our son is headed to the hospital, but we did not have very many details at all. Nate and a couple of friends and I, we went out to just go skate around. I had a friend come visit from back home, so it was kind of just Hey, as a bunch of guys, let's, you know, go out and go skate and just enjoy the night. We ended up skating in a neighborhood that none of us had ever been in before. Um, and yeah, decided to just take that fateful turn right. Um, and I remember being in the front, you know, as everybody seems to, um, as we were going down this hill and thinking, all right, this is a little too fast and slowing down um, and just being back behind everybody. And, you know, there weren't really many other thoughts, just kind of. I look to my left and I see headlights, but I don't see a car. I look back to my right and I see Nate, who's around 100 feet in front of me at this point. And I start yelling, Nate, Nate. At that point, it was too late and Nate, got hit by the truck. We made it up to UCI and uh, I was so eager to get in that I get out of the car and I'm going and Michelle's like, wait for me, wait for me. I was um, reaching for his hand because he was taking off. I was, I needed to get to him. When they admit him in the hospital, he's not admitted as his name. He's admitted as a John they had Doe. to get they had to give him like a John Doe name, otherwise they couldn't treat him without consent. One of the neurosurgeons that worked on him came out and asked us to come up to this separate private room. Um, and so it's just Michelle and I, as two neurosurgeons explained uh, that Nate might die. That um, there was a decent chance because of the the seriousness of his injuries that he wasn't going to make it through the next twenty four hours. When he hit his head, um, obviously his brain got seriously impacted. He had stopped breathing for a significant period of time. And uh, so they, they did the surgery and, and the, they even told us that if Nate had been in his 30s and had this level of injury, they would have let him go. The emergency room neurosurgeon, which we met later, uh, explained this to us, that because of his age and because he was healthy, 
um, despite the severity of the injury, that they did everything that they could to, to save his life. It's funny, I don't even really remember seeing Nate for the first time. I have to go back and look at pictures and remind myself. I think that it's because it didn't look like Nate. Mm -hmm. it's not. It his looked... head was like this big, round, He was very swollen and... Um, he had tubes in his mouth. Tubes and bandages all over his face. So it didn't, it didn't look like Nate was the problem. So the original surgery they did was they removed the right side of his skull and had to take out all the blood and all the fluids that were building up there. That was the primary first surgery they did. And the next day, because the swelling had continued, they needed to remove the left part of his skull. A craniectomy is a neurosurgical procedure that we do to give the brain more room for swelling. Oftentimes, with head trauma, the brain is shaken up or there are blood clots that cause the brain to swell, what we call edema. So what you're trying to do is remove a portion of the skull so the brain can swell. And over time, the swelling goes down. Eventually, we'll put the bone back, even months later. We were both physically exhausted. I remember the first time we walked out of Nate's room. We had a whole waiting room filled with people that were praying for us and worshiping and just really on their knees before God to be there for us. And I remember going in there to try to explain to them what was happening so they can pray specifically about the next part of the surgery. April 1st, 2020, Nate was discharged. We have pictures of the paramedics bringing him in through the front door to our hospital bed. And that night, we just <laughs> completely fell apart. How, what did we just do? No nurses here, no, I mean, this is our first night alone with Nate. He, we are responsible for him now. We have to no feed him, here, no we have nurses. to clean him. No doctors here, no nurses. And we felt a bit stressed for sure but um, we felt very supported by the ho the nurses in the hospital continued to when they when they heard that we wanted to bring him home, they told us and encouraged us that that was going to be the, the best decision. decision. Um, and we got training. They showed yeah. us like how to take care of things. But it's just you know bringing him home. He was medically stable, but not neurologically really anywhere. Yeah. Two fingers. Good job, buddy. Okay, put him back. Nate, can you give mom a fist bump? Fist bump. We uh, mixed formula stuff. So it's basically, it's this like whole foods, all natural, organic. We like to joke that Nate is eating healthier than he ever has the whole rest of his life. You know, Chick-fil-A, Rubio's, Raising Cane's was his former diet. Um, so, right, huh? <laughs> so, wow, it's so we, mix, we mix his vitamins and and medicine and stuff in here. Um, and then we give him, we feed, he has a feeding tube that goes into his stomach directly. So his food goes directly into his stomach. And he had stomach issues before, like pretty much his whole life. There's some weird stomach thing he had where if he ate too fast, he would get full really quickly or feel sick. And when he was young, he used to throw up pretty regularly. And so, and we've noticed since he's kind of gotten to a more an alert state that if we feed him too fast or too much, some of the similar things happen. So we kind of try to feed him a little bit like um, if you're eating food and you're sitting at a table and you're just kind of you take a few bites, get him down, talk to some people. 
that we try to feed him, we'll give him in little chunks. The thing that keeps me going when things are hard is that I can trust that God is doing something good. That God is using Nate's story to help other people know him better. Uh, that he's using what happened with Nate to grow our faith. Now the interesting thing is, and this is a heart issue that I still keep working on, is part of me doesn't want it to be that way. I still, if I had the choice, even given the impact that our story has had, and we've had so many people that have emailed us or talked to us and said, oh my goodness, your faith in this crisis has really helped bolster my faith, and I love hearing that. But the truth in my heart is that I would give all of that up if I could have Nate back. I would in a heartbeat give up every ounce of faith that I've learned and, and every impact that we've had so that I can have Nate back. And so that, that that's part of the wrestling of God's sovereignty that I still deal with is that I do believe that God is sovereign, but I still want him to do what I want him to do. Nate's girlfriend, Camille, uh, they were dating at the time of the accident. And so obviously this impacted her and her life tremendously. She was with us at UCI. She was with us at Kaiser. When we brought Nate home, she made what was really a, a mature but difficult decision. She decided to move in with us. So she moved in, she was living upstairs at our house and she became part of our caretaking routine. Mm -hmm. uh, so rather than going home and coming back and risking bring, bringing COVID here, yeah. she decided to move into, a, into our house with us. And one of the absolute highlight blessings of this journey and COVID is getting to know her better. Mm -hmm. Like we knew her cause she was a student in one of my classes and in my youth group, but she is an amazing woman and her loyalty to me is through the roof. You could tell that she loved him. She was involved in all sorts of areas of his care. And she was just part of making this journey we were on that felt so alone and part of a bigger story. My name is John Izzo, and I'm a physical therapist, and I'm one of the members of uh, Nate's care team. Um, Nate, we're gonna be doing some movement, all right? I'm gonna get you moving a little bit. So, Nate has some difficulties with movement and controlling his own movements. So my job with him is to help prevent all of the issues that come with deconditioning and an inability to move yourself. So I'm helping him move in ways that he's unable to move himself right now. Good job, buddy. brain is unable to regulate what his resting muscle tone is like in his body. So what I try to do is take the muscle tone and modify it so that he's able to, to relax and feel more comfortable. When Nate's accident happened, this backyard, it used to have grass, but it was just basically this big, nasty dirt mound of mess. And there was a day we came out here, one of the days early on after we first got Nate in the wheelchair, we came out and we tried walking him around and it was really hard. And we started brainstorming about maybe putting some pavers in or something. And a friend heard about this. We have a good friend who's been really helpful for us along this journey. And he runs a construction company and he said, hey, that's something we can help with. And so what happened was, they kind of came and started asking what we want. And, and the main things we are looking for is a pathway around the backyard so that we can take Nate around and let him kind of enjoy the outdoors. We've always been kind of an outdoorsy family. And so having an opportunity to get Nate out, to get him around in the backyard, even 
when he gets to a point where he can do some things himself to push him around a path to build up his strength. And so what they did is they were very generous, did way more than we expected, and they put in the path around here, they put the grass in because they realized that we're really bad at keeping grass alive. Over here, so this is what we call it Nate's tree. We do milestone birthdays for our kids, and so at each birthday we do something special. For Nate's 18th birthday uh, two years ago, we had a time where a bunch of important men in his life came over and we prayed over him and we planted this tree. The tree was kind of an important symbol early on in March after Nate's accident. I woke up one morning and was wondering if his tree had survived because that would have been its first season past winter. And I came out here and it had little teeny tiny buds on it. And so this tree has kind of been an important thing. When they were doing the construction in the backyard, <laughs> Michelle was like, make sure they know not to touch the tree. My name is Matthew Lewis, and I'm Nate's younger brother. Ever since I was a kid, Nate and I have always had a very strong relationship. I don't have very many memories before the age of four, but those that I do all revolve around Nate and playing with him, um, whether if that's him and I playing with our foam snakes and trying to wrap them around each other's legs and knock each other off our feet, or climbing around our tree house, jumping off the edge, or playing on monkey bars. He's always been, in a way, my best friend. And I say in a way because when I'm talking about my sibling, friendship relationships get very different a lot of the times. Um, we always had a friendly rivalry in everything we did that made me want to get better. And even when he was with his own friends, he would always want me along to play with him and he was never embarrassed of me and he always protected me from any harm that could come my way and any dangers and embarrassment or anything else that could happen to me. There's a lot of different emotions I feel on a day-to-day -day basis um, concerning Nate's accident. I'll be completely honest and say a lot of the times I feel angry at God or questioning of why this would happen. Most of the time I'm able to bring myself to a place where I remember that no matter what is happening in this life, my future in God is guaranteed and my brother's future in God is guaranteed. If I've learned one thing from this, I think it's that no matter what I'm going through, no matter how I'm feeling, I need to be able to put my emotions and my feelings and my thoughts all in God, since he is the only constant that I can be grounded in. I believe that God gives us what we need for the moment that we're in and not the moment that's coming. And in that moment, God says, I'm here with you in this. I think God has taught me something that is both incredibly painful but also incredibly sanctifying, which is that I am not in complete control over my life. I thought I was. And admittedly, sometimes I still think I do have control over my life, but through Nate's accident, I realized that I'm not God, which is both terrifying and also comforting. spending eternity with God, all the pain that we have felt on earth is just going to be a distant memory. That's how I've been able to pull myself through this situation in life. this difficult season, there's so much to be thankful for. And so I would encourage people to find where you can give thanks. How do you see what is happening in your tough season? How can you be thankful? 